extraordinary that we don't own that. You know, it's an it's a English language word, and yet this is the way it's, it's turned around. So think of the value proposition on that, of finding something that exists in the world that is now branded as a Disney thing. And uh, so we're kind of proud of that. I, unfortunately, if any of you have been there in the last 15 years, there is a ride that does not live up to what we wanted to do with it, and that's unfortunate. They have uh, put in something that really doesn't you know, bring the life to the characters at all, but they've been sustained. They stay very popular with the merchandise, and Marvel was so taken with the Figment characters that they created a um, Marvel comic series that came out uh, featuring Figment and Dreamfinder in their previous adventures before and after. I keep hoping the studio will push this one to make a movie franchise out of it. I think it would be fantastic, but I don't get to make decisions anymore. <laughs> so we are now to the one that I probably would surprise you that I didn't start with. Because, you know, you hear everybody talks about storytelling and the importance of it. But if you haven't created the environment that I've taken you through thus far, I think the story can fall flat. You can have a great story in a horrible cauldron where there's no means to get it uh, voiced forward. And you can have a great, or a bad story that's in a great ability where, with a lot of work and, and, and you know, others coming in on it, you can actually make a pretty good thing out of a bad story. So we see both examples. So the ideal thing is where you have all of these things that I've set up working for you, and then you have a great storyteller. In our day and world, there's nobody that's better than Jay Rawlin. She took two generations of kids. And when I do this class at UCLA, uh, and I look out the students, it's starting to change a little bit now, but generally when I say, how many of you were in line at a, at a Barnes & Noble at midnight? on release date for one of these books, and it's like this. She managed to grab a generation that was more prone to be digital with hard, hardbound books, just because when I questioned the students, they'd say, well, I didn't want to be left out. I didn't want the next day to be you know, with my friends and not know the next adventure of these characters. They're so well drawn, they're so well, uh, the, the, the vocabulary she uses and the words she created, I mean, every one of them is so, rememberable, <laughs> I guess would be one of my ways of, of characterizing that. But I, you know, all of them, Dementors, all of that stuff, it just became almost a new form of uh, English language. And so they permeated the culture. And uh, I think that's the best storytelling uh, that's happened in the last, uh, you know, since the millennium. So what makes a good story? Uh, what's the difference between uh, just a good story and a great one? Well, people find themselves in the good ones, great ones. And if you think of Harry Potter, we are all in that school. As we go through that book, we're thinking about how much better that would have been if I could have gone to a school like Hogwarts <laughs> instead of the school I had to go to. And so you find, that, you find it because there's enough in there that we've all touched. We've ever been to school or we're in school or we're in the process of getting ready to go to school. And so all of that is, is highly personalized to us from the characters that we find in it. Now, at the park, in creating something like Indiana Jones, we're lucky because we're going to actually take you into our story. So that puts us at an advantage. But you can still do, we all, you know, you can give me a catalog of what you feel where we've done it well and where we haven't been that successful. But I think in the case of Indiana Jones, we, we did pull that off where we put people into something. You go, I cannot believe that I'm in this thing. It's like Indiana Jones. We're out of control. We're running around in this temple with no way out. And I'm here, you know, I'm in the middle of it. So, you know, being able to do that is a fantastic ability. Now, uh, making the complex simple. Uh, if people don't get something, their first reaction is usually to just say, it's stupid. Because you're not gonna say, I'm stupid, I couldn't understand that story. You're gonna say, that story is stupid because it didn't make any sense. So you put the blame on the, the author rather than on the, the reader. So, in translating that into something where, for the last 15 minutes, you've been panic-stricken that you're about to go down this incredibly <laughs> steep, long hill, and maybe you're going to get soaking wet, and maybe you're going to die, even, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, after that's over, we know exactly what kind of mood you're in. You're absolutely euphoric that you survived, and you're not totally soaked, maybe. And you're, um, you know, now capable for the first time to fully enjoy this experience. So when you turn into our finale, 
There's a lot going on here that you don't really think about, but it works on your brain. When we think of the end of something, it's the sunset, so the sun is going down. When we think of the end of the year, it's autumn. The leaves are changing on the trees. And of course, in Hollywood, they've taught us that when everybody comes out and sings at the end, it's over. So you've got uh, all these things going so that what's going on dialogue-wise in the story, it's in the boat. It's like, how wet did you get? Oh my God, I thought I was going to die. And blah, 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 all that's what's going on. That's your story. When you go home and talk to grandma and grandpa, you're going to say, oh, you won't believe it. We were up there. We thought we were going to, you know, all of this stuff. And so what we can do is just enhance that. So in that moment of euphoria, you work to make it as simple as possible that everybody gets on the same track, that here we come, this is the big finale to the show. Okay, another one. Um, great storytellers can make the ordinary magical. Uh, a little fountain we developed for Epcot when it opened got the premier billing in Time magazine when they reviewed Epcot. Now we had an energy pavilion, a spaceship Earth, we had all these big impressive things and they said the one run, run away amazing thing at the Epcot opening were the gardens outside Journey into Imagination where they had transformed formed water into literally living characters. So when you look at that little girl's face and she's watching that water, she's trying to figure where it's going to go next, what it's going to think about, where is it going to land, and she's saying to her mom probably, I'm going to try and catch it. Now this is the same stuff we drink every day, we bathe in it, we do all these rudimentary things and yet, for the first time ever, we turned it, we transformed it into a living character that was performing there to music and jumping all around. Now, it was an easily doable idea that was transformable. It was transformable. So, you've probably seen this in every mall in America since then. But it, for the first time, it was Epcot in 1992. And truly, it was an astonishing thing to set something up in a way that had never been looked at before. Okay, so now this one is, you know, people go on these rides because they like to be scared. They like to risk their health in a safe way. They like coming to Disney because they trust us that we're not going to do something really terrible to them, but they're going to get close to feeling that. So there's a little formula I'm going to share with you that um, ensures that we get people in the right mood, and that is that fear minus death <laughs> equals thrill. It's as simple as that. Okay, number six, I'm not good at this, I'm not a good salesman, never have been, they can see right through me, um, but this is the best salesman I've ever seen, and if you saw DreamWorks' Puss in Boots, it was played by Antonio Banderas, a great, you know, bravado, and then as soon as he'd want to get his way, he'd put on that, you know, irresistible pussycat smile. And I said, that is what it's all about, is how do you effectively sell your concept? You've got to use all the tools that you can. I had an architect working on our team who had the most articulate British accent you could imagine. And we would always pull him out and say, you're going to have to do the presentation today. <laughs> because even if they didn't know what you were pitching, they'd say, it must be good, because listen to how great he is, you know. So, if any of you are British, you have an unfair advantage, and if you're Australian, that counts for about half. So, <laughs> but those of us that speak, you know, American, no way, no advantage at all. So, salesmanship can be very, very important to taking good ideas and getting them passed. And uh, likewise, you can you can lose good ideas by not having the ability to sell it. This was a concept for a conservation pavilion in Epcot. Uh, back when conservation wasn't a subject. Uh, so we were proposing that we'd see all the biomes of the land from, the, from down at the swamps and deserts up to the high altitude elevations with frozen temperatures and so forth. And the, uh, the, the energy exchange in the building would be neutralized so that the hot areas would be producing the runoff to cool the cool areas and vice versa. So the idea was to make it a totally self-sustaining thing. And to do that, we don't have the skills in Imagineering, so we hired the University of Arizona to come in and work with us. And so they had worked out the whole system. And we were so excited to be building this. And then we finally got a sponsor. And instead of a company that might be concerned with the environment, we got Kraft Foods. They're involved in selling cheese. <laughs> and so they said, 
we like the farming idea, we're all into that, but we don't have any reason to save the forests and all of this stuff. So it went flush down the toilet, that was the end of this pavilion. And Dr. Carl Hodges from the university um, was so positive about how great this was going to be. They said, don't worry, Tony, I'm going to build it. I said, you're going to build it at a university? How are you going to get the money to do that? And he said, it's going to happen. And so if you visit the University of Arizona, you will be able to visit Biosphere 2, which used all the principles that he developed for the land to be in. And they had people living inside the structure, sealed off from Biosphere 1, which is planet Earth. They were sealed off, and they grew everything, and they breathed all the air, and they exchanged all the the nutrients and things in there for two years without ever having to re-enter the normal atmosphere. So it proved that it could be done, and it's now open, I think, as a tourist center uh, as part of the university. And so that was a way of pers you know, pursuing your dream outside of the method you might have. Now for me, as a ride operator at Disneyland, I uh, ran the submarine ride. And we went through, I won't get into the politics of our company, but there's times when it's really positive, and then there are times where it's looking for every possible way to save money. One of which is to close rides, you know, because then you don't have to pay to operate them. And they had closed the submarine ride, which was one of my favorite things. It let families do something that, again, you can't do unless you go spend hundreds of dollars in Hawaii to take a submarine. But at Disneyland, for free, you can take your children on this ride and go underwater, and the whole exciting experience of doing that was very different than Space Mountain or a dark ride in Fantasyland. It really broadened what Disneyland was. So to lose it, I was having a conniption fit. So I figured, I've got to find a way to sell bringing that back. So we were developing a movie called Atlantis, The Lost Continent. And I said, well, we can make a very spooky ride out of it, where they had a Leviathan monster that was a big metallic evil monster. It could crush the submarine, and we put little spritzers of water coming in and everyone would be terrified. I think it would be almost too terrifying, you know, because you're really underwater. And uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so then the movie came out and guess what? It was a turkey. And so the next thing on tap at the studio was a treasure planet. And I said, well, I'm not done yet. So let's try to make a thing where interactivity, that's the new buzzword. So everyone's going to have a claw that they can send down into the treasury of Atlantis and everything you can dig up in like three minutes is yours to keep, you know? That would be really cool and uh, a fun thing. And so then that movie came out and likewise, it was another turkey. <laughs> but then, the third time they always say is a charm. And uh, Pixar brought out Finding Nemo and it was the number one animated film of all time. And so off the charts. And all of a sudden, people that didn't want to hear you talking about anything, I said, well, isn't that unnatural to put those characters on the submarine ride? And of course it was, because it brought two things. It brought my generation, who was longing their nostalgic old ride back, and it brought children who were growing up with the mythology of Nemo. It brought them on the ride. So you had a, a really great family ride that everybody could go on and enjoy sharing the experience together. So that took us into... Uh, a world that uh, I thought we'd never see again. They were, there was ruthful people saying that can be a fabulous storage area for all the merchandise back under that cavern. <laughs> the cavern is as big as parts of the Caribbean that you travel through, so it would have been a great warehouse for stuff. But anyway, it's now operating again, and it was a great experience. Uh, Pixar uh, did all the animation for us, and it was a fabulous experience. There's technologies in this ride that you can't believe how the, the electricity is, is broadcast through the water from a bus bar, through the water, into the boat, then translated into uh, electricity and stored in storage cells on board. I said, that is never gonna work. They filled the lagoon up and it worked the day that they filled it up and, and ever since. Pixar came in and had to animate all these creatures in a real underwater environment. So they had to come down, look at their animation, and then put the lighting on the characters that match the lighting that we actually had in the show scenes that was physically in the, in the park. So if Dory enters a volcano, uh, the uplighting on Dory, which is on film, had to be matched to the actual uplighting coming up out of the volcano. And they go, we've never had to do this before. We've always controlled it. But it ended up 
you know, the, this partnership between Andrew Stanton and John and myself. Uh, and I, they brought out a monorail that day. I said, that is really cool. The monorail was made look like uh, the submarine. And it was what I call an insanely great outcome to have all those things come together and you go, wow. The only weird thing, I met Steve Jobs the only time I you know, met Steve, he came down to ride it. And uh, usually when people of that stature get off, they go, oh, it was wonderful. We really enjoyed it. It was lovely. Great. Congratulations. So you're kind of expecting this kind of platitude thing. And he gets off and he says, wow, what happened with the East Australian current? That was terrible. You know, and, and you're kind of like, whoa, OK. And, and it was. It really is. It's the weak thing in the ride. We ran out of money. People wrote it from management and said the same thing. Well, what are you going to do to fix that? And all we could do at that late moment was put a bubble in the water that had a projector in it pointed at the wall with turtles swimming by and projected on the wall and it, you know, it got by but it wasn't the best thing and I, at first I, you're shocked by that but then going back to all the reasons I've quoted Steve, if you think about this man that has such limited amount of time to give to everybody, he realized if he said to me, oh that was great, we loved it, all that, what, what good is that? He wanted us to know that there was a weak spot in it. Like, why did you let that go? Now, he didn't know all the frustration of the budgets and all that stuff that we went through, but he had identified exactly the weak spot on that. So I really ended up admiring him extremely much for that uh, observation, that he found the one weak spot in the show. Okay, the last one. Disney is known for astonishing detail. And uh, I put it at the very end here because one of the worst mistakes you can do is spending a ton of money early on in a project on detail when you don't have the story and you don't have something that has gone through all the things I've brought to your attention today. Once you've passed all those things and you have like a world like Harry Potter, I don't know if any of you have been to the one in Florida. I don't like the one here, but the one in Florida is spectacular. And you look at it and you go, the things that came out of Jay Rowling's mind have all been materialized perfectly in that project down there. So again, the detail was the last step. They got everything else right and then you lavish on the detail. In our uh, world, probably Norman Rockwell, the illustrator, was one of the best at dealing with detail and storytelling. He never painted a thing before he had a great story in this picture. So we're all humorously laughing at this self-portrait element. And then he lavished it with the detail for which he was known, which is the beautiful painterly quality of probably America's foremost illustrator. But it wasn't just his ability as a great illustrative painter, it was his ability to tell stories. And I think his illustrations are probably more well known because of how much they touched all of us as a people. Okay. So now in this whole thing of detail, uh, we went back into Paris with a castle. And I'm going, we have the task of bringing a castle to Paris where it's a whole world of castles already. You know, I can drive 100 miles and you can see Chinoso and Chambord and uh, all of these places. And they were all mostly copied in the Disney World castle. And then Disneyland's castle was copied, uh, it was a copy of Neuschwanstein in Germany. So we said, we are in trouble. So we had to go back to the drawing boards and kind of bring back the fantasy into it and, and make it something that wouldn't be reflective of what you'd see elsewhere. And these are three-dimensional sculptures, so when you put a tower up and you look at it from the perfect view in the front, it takes on a whole different thing when you turn it on the side. And I can't tell you how many hours you spend looking at it from every possible view, trying to get a combination, this being from the back side, where all of those things work together. Likewise, on the inside of this castle, you know, right down the street is Notre Dame with all its beautiful Gothic interiors and stained glass windows. What are we going to say to the French about that? So again, we had to reinvent the interior of a Gothic structure and create, in this case, stone trees holding up the ceiling. And what's fun about the stained glass, they were done by the Queen's private com commission in, uh, in, in, in England who had retired recently from doing all the great Westminster Cathedral restorations and whatnot. And he came out of retirement to do this, and I said, you know, we're really pleased to have you 
do this for us, but I'm curious what drove you to come uh, to our place and do this. And he said, well, when you spent your whole life terrorizing people, you want to do something that makes them laugh. And I said, explain. <laughs> and he said, have you ever looked at stained glass windows? Agony. Repent. It's <laughs> horrifying. And he said, I would like to make people happy. And I could go to my grave knowing I did that. So at 85 years old, he came to work and, and did all this beautiful work in our castle. And I can tell you, it doesn't look like any other place in the world. And of course, going back to the beginning of today's story, um, I got my dragon. And they said, we well, don't have any money for you to do that. I said, well, I'll make the castle a little smaller and then I'll have money left over to put the dragon in. They said, we're not giving you any operational credit or capacity for that dragon, which means that you have to find capacity elsewhere in the park. So I said, all right, I'll, I'll take that. But the, the thrilling part of it, this guy wakes up and growls and snorts out smoke and everything, and kids go in there and they walk around in this cavern under the castle, and all of a sudden it comes to life and flies up and they go running in every direction. <laughs> and so when we do our interviews and we say, what are your favorite things? Big Thunder, Pirates of the Caribbean, and the dragon in the castle. And so I took that in there and I said, and I don't get any credit for number three, you know? So anyway, so detail is a very important thing. We just opened Avatar at Walt Disney World, uh, Pandora, the land of Avatar. And again, the engineers were faced with, you want us to put, you know, 50 ton rocks floating above the heads of all the people walking through. Yeah, why not? They did it in the movie. Yeah, see, the <laughs> guy is, is, is easy. When you've got real people in hurricanes, and we've already gone through our first hurricane with this, but when you look at the detail in this land, these are all artificial uh, plants that are living in this environment. So it's like you stepped off planet Earth and, and again, the thing that really sells you being on Pandora is the level of detail. You've never seen anything like that in your life. Um, and it works not just on the exterior, but on the interior too, where you go into these experiences where we can do a lot more where we've got the controlled environment than you have outside. Now, we took that to a new level in terms of audiometronics. At the end of this ride, I have a very terrible little short clip of the Navi storyteller, but uh, if you know anything about audiometronics, I think you'll see in this figure we've, we've broken new ground with the complexity of it. That's all I have. I'm sure I can get better now off of YouTube, but that's where it was before it opened last summer. So that brings me now to kind of a wrap-up where I've picked a subject that I thought would give you a good demonstration of how all of these things have come together in something that we all know, and that would be the space program. So you had a visionary thinker in the form of Jules Verne who fueled that fuel for the future. He created these images of launching from Central Florida humans into space uh, over 100, almost 150 years ago. And, uh, that probably ignited a lot of little engineering kids reading those books to, to take that dream and actually go somewhere. So that fueled the future. Then you get someone like Kennedy, who was a very maverick in, in his behavior of saying, I'm just going to make a blanket statement that here we are in 1960, I want us on the moon by the end of this decade. And you can get all, I can imagine all the but, 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 we don't have computers, we have no way of controlling none of this stuff. And was, I'm sorry, we're going to be on the moon before the end of the decade. You've got to have that kind of confidence in the, in the beginning. And then you had people like Werner von Braun who'd gotten out of Germany and come over and Walt Disney picked him up and said, let's visualize this for the public. So the two of them worked and created a series of astonishing television shows that showed what it was going to be like to go into space. And Eisenhower was president at that time and he called Walt the next day and said, you did more to get the United States people behind the space program than all the bills before Congress. And as a result, he said, could you allow me to show those films in Washington so that they can understand how to make this something that the public is really excited about. And I think what's happened in the decades since landing on the moon is there's apathy about any excitement for doing this. That's why Musk, Elon Musk has sort of brought a little bit of that back to, to life, where the, throwing a rocket up in there with a, with a Tesla car and a mannequin in it 
my God, that makes it seem really fun again. Then you need that mental real estate. So the idea of linking it with the name Apollo, a god of, of ancient Greece, and, uh, and then the moon, owning the moon. The idea of owning the moon, that we planted our flag on the moon. These have tremendous value creation in the same way of creating a figment or any of the other things. So giving it that personality suddenly made the whole idea of going to the moon a much more tangible thing. And then again, going back to the storytelling aspect of it, Walt realized, why not let the public go to the moon at Disneyland? So from 1955, when the park opened until we closed the moon ride after landing on the moon and made it the Mars ride, uh, we were allowing people to see what it would be like to take a rocket, leave the Earth, and, and circle the moon. I remember there was a, a lost civilization on the backside of the moon that really spooked me out as a kid. They'd send a flare down, and they go, they're a true mystery, a lost civilization on the dark side of the moon. They took that out later on because they thought it was too speculative, but it, it was what drove me as a kid to want to find out about the moon. And then we go back to Kennedy again. There was no better salesmanship in that decade because he was able to persuade the American people to again, you know, back this thing that you could almost say was ludicrous in its attempt to do something. The computing power on Space Mountain is far greater than the power they had to take man to the moon back in the 60s. So that's just, the, and by today's standards, it was absolutely nothing. So that was all pretty much done by, by hand, you know, the whole thing. And the end results are these incredible details. Uh, that footprint on the moon, I remember I was in Tomorrowland at Disneyland and they had a giant screen uh, and they projected this when it was done. And it was surreal being in this future world place. Space Mountain wasn't there yet. But they had a, a, a pavilion there where they were showing this. And, you know, to be thinking, here I am in Tomorrowland, there's the rocket to the moon, and there is the first footprint on the moon. And so all of that worked really strongly together to make that happen. And you need that kind of a, a, a coming together of all the different perspectives to make something have the lasting value. That, that we're still talking about this. And since I lived through it, it still seems like the future to me. And the frightening thing is to think that it happened in 1969. And so from our perspective now, it's almost 50 years ago. And these images still look, you know, contemporary to all of us. So that brings me to this. In 1968, there was a very speculative film that was done uh, by uh, Stanley Kubrick uh, called 2001. Uh, it was pretty freaky and it didn't make all the most sense in the world, but it was pretty out there in terms of what it did. Now, was anyone in the audience 12 when this movie came out? Going back to my, how things can affect you when you're 12 year old, and don't see anyone. Was anyone 12 in 2001? The year 2001, no? Wow, I usually get a few on one or the other of those. Well, I'm gonna show one minute from this film because there was a very impressionable 12 year old back in 1968, who saw this film. And as this one minute unfolds, I think you'll get a hint as to how he changed the world because of the things that he saw that were gonna be commonplace in this movie, and they've affected our lives. And probably you already know who it's gonna be, but here we go, one minute. <laughs> Sure. 
with Ratatouille going, Ratatouille going into Florida, do you think that that crew will be able to pivot into a new pavilion? Now that Gigantic is off the board, will it not be Spain? Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so I, I, the question was, Ratatouille is going into the French pavilion in Florida. That's been announced. And whether Coco would go into Spain, is that what you're thinking? Well, it was gigantic, was yeah, Spanish yeah, yeah. movie that got taken yeah. off the, the board. Yeah, Coco would go into Mexico, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, I haven't heard anything more than that. I know that they're, they, of course, added a lot of controversy about this because Epcot has been about um, culture and uh, the future and technologies. And they've started to mix some of the characters in there. Uh, I think fairly well with the Frozen ride, and it's in the Norway Pavilion. Not so well with the Nemo ride and the Seas Pavilion, but you know, and I don't like what they did with Figment, but uh, that's another story. But yeah, it's, it's kind of this dilemma of trying to make it more uh, uh, attractive to the general audience. So it's a good question. I, I'm sorry to see Gigantic go. I was really excited about that. It was going to be a take on uh, the, um, you know, what is it? The, the Jack and the Beanstalk, but done with kind of a, a Spanish overlay. Yeah, back here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so going back to the uh, Tower of Terror. Yeah. Um, I was one of those people that didn't like those changes. Yeah. Um, but I, I did. I did go on the Guardians of the Galaxy. Yes. I did enjoy it. I absolutely loved that movie. Yeah. But I didn't like that it was being changed. But anyway. Um, <laughs> and so. Okay. One of the reasons I didn't like that change is because I felt that it was a unique experience within Disneyland. Mm -hmm. um, like, it was a throwback to uh, um, the Twilight Zone, or, uh, yeah, um, the Twilight Zone, and that's something that you don't see anywhere else on the Disneyland property, and it just had that sort of uh, interesting atmosphere that mm -hmm. I don't think... Have you been on the one in Florida? No, okay. okay. That's, that Florida that's, one is ten times as good as that one. Yeah, and it's just amazing. And that goes back to my point. Yeah, I didn't know there was an yeah. attraction like that in Florida. I didn't know that it was that it was a worse version of something else. That's where I came down on it. I looked at it. I said it's always going to be number two. You're all saying, yeah, but the Florida one is better. Now, with Guardians, everybody says, wow, you've been on Guardians, and there's nothing to measure by it's unique into itself. Right. And so, so I think they made the right decision in that case, because those, those decisions you have to make about getting rid of something are always very difficult. We had to decide with Winnie the Pooh, it was absolutely coming to Disneyland. So either lose the Toad Ride or lose the Country Bear Jamboree. And I picked the Jungle Country Bear because there's a Country Bear show in Florida. So people that want to ride that can still do that. And they took out the toad ride in Florida, and they don't have one. So now we have the toad ride, and they have the bear show. So if you're a real Disney fan, you can still see everything rather than losing something forever. So it's a bad, a bad decision you get forced into making. But I think I would have to say we, I think we made the right decision in that case. Cause 